Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, today we're going to talk about an interview that Shintaro Furukawa, the president and CEO of Nintendo of Japan, aka all of Nintendo, uh, said in a recent interview with Nikkei. Now the translation is being provided by uh, Japanese Nintendo. It's a, a website that specifically targets bringing Japanese uh, Nintendo news uh, in English. So it makes it a lot easier for us to, to get things like this interview. Now, the entire interview isn't translated, but this is just uh, the important tidbits. And this is Shintaro Furukawa right there. And we're going to read through this interview. And we're going to talk about what it means. Uh, we're going to talk about what it means and specifically to the future of Nintendo. Uh, and specifically maybe what it means for the future of the Switch Pro. I know that's been kind of a hot button topic uh, to start this year. And <laughs> I mean, this is like my third video in a little over a week on on uh, Switch Pro, but I want to talk about it because I feel like there is um, some interesting information to glean here as Shintura Furukawa actually talks about technology, which based on what I remember uh, and, and what I've done on research from what Iwata has said uh, and what Tetsu Tatsumi Kimishima, Kimishima said, uh, you know, the last two presidents and CEOs of Nintendo, even though one of them was just a temporary one, um, they really kind of stayed away from talking about technology that much outside of talking about the ways we play games uh so things like the wiimote or vr or ar stuff like that and some of that's touched upon here but it, it seems to go a little bit deeper uh when you read into it and the big thing to remember is shinjiro furukawa does not really have a background in video games he is a businessman uh so his perspective and his thought processes might be different than we've gotten from other presidents so let's just get into the interview uh, and see what it says. So uh, there was a part one of the translation uh, that we're not going to go through right now because that didn't have to do with uh, technology um, in in the way that uh, that that traditionally uh, we think about it. You know, it, it talked about games as a life essential product and stuff. But now we're going to get into um, what is actually happening with the technology side from Nintendo. So so Nick Kay says cutting edge technologies keep getting implemented through games such as 5G and AR. Furukawa says, new technologies are getting adapted first in games in this world. After many years and months, people who play video games grow up from children to parents. Um, and uh, it's the result of how gaming, which was only done by children in the past, has expanded to a broader generation. Pokemon Go uses AR. It produces a social phenomenon where men and women, young and old, sally forth around towns in order to collect characters that appear here and there. Games that give many people exper uh, experiences uh, that make them say, I did this for the first time, but this is so interesting have the power to change even people's behaviors, which is true. Video games can affect your behaviors. Uh, Nikkei says, a competition that transcends the frame of content such as video games and music is beginning. Furukawa responds, it's not something that has just begun now. Games are not life essential. I can't stress that enough, guys. Games are not life essential. But they're nice to have, aren't they? Uh, products. So it would be strange for customers to leave them someday. That's what I had always been told about ever since I joined this company, being Nintendo. Uh, I always have that sense of danger and feel like it's the fate of game and entertainment businesses. In that meaning, it's a very harsh business. There's a flood of methods to play, and the time-stealing competition revolving around consumers' limited available free time is getting fiercer. Games are dealing with that competition while having to continue producing innovations from hereafter. So uh, it's, it, he's talking about how games are in a competition for your free time. Uh, there's more competition than ever for your free time. Uh, and it's a competition that's never going to end. And games need to keep progressing forward in order to stay kind of ahead of the curve. Because video games are right now the number one, um, at least grossing money-wise, entertainment business in the entire world. Bigger than sports, bigger than... Um, you know, just traditional TV and, and Netflix and stuff. It, it's a huge market. Uh, and to stay there, it, they need to keep innovating and keep making games that people want to play, basically. Uh, Nikkei said, can games continue to stay as cradles that produce innovations? Furukawa responds, innovation is making something that many people thought impossible with common sense possible. It's important to always ask ourselves, is there something else impossible that we can make possible? When things we thought... This gameplay is technologically impossible, become possible with some sort of idea, 
we are able to surprise people. There will be even more initiatives that transcend the frame of games that everyone has been imagining. Games that contribute to healthcare by moving bodies, like the Wii, and games that can actually be used to train memory power are also born. You know, brain age, stuff like that. Uh, it's the result after having probed what we could to match subjects that are being played by many customers with games. If we find something that's interesting, we step into there. If we do that, sometimes innovations can be born. So a lot of this is just talking about marrying technology and uh, game innovative ideas together to impact people's lives in different ways and find new audiences. This is something Nintendo's been doing for quite some time. You really back to the NES, if we're completely honest. Uh, and obviously they've been excelling at it in spades from the Wii era on forward. Um, how do games change with technology? Furukawa goes, the most important thing when a new technology appears, new technology, is how the quality of the user's gaming experience changes. It's very important for games themselves to be interesting, new, and to be able to give surprises. Regardless of the technological environment, those who develop games for first create content that they think consumers will want to obtain and play. After that, if there is a technology that is useful for that, they'll adopt it. The gaming population has a broad base. Other than that, it's also easy to spread technologies that have been accepted by games. For example, touchscreens expanded to smartphones after it was used in the Nintendo DS. Which, yes, the DS actually did come out before touchscreens were popularized in smartphones. There were um, Blackberries and stuff like that that did have uh, capacitive touchscreens and stuff kind of like the DS, but uh, those weren't the popular brand of phones. Those were like the business-savvy phones, uh, so rich people phones. Um, funny how Blackberries kind of fall in from those days when they were actually ahead of the curve with smart devices. Anyways, um, I find this interesting, especially this last bit here, because uh, we don't often hear Nintendo talk about new technologies. Um, and he's not just talking about it in the way that people play games. Uh, obviously, you know, we can focus on the controls and the way Nintendo has changed that, but the Switch itself is more of a traditional way of controlling games. Um, you could talk about how, oh, they do the split Joy-Cons and you can play them sideways multiplayer, and that's maybe that's innovative or something. Uh, but the motion controls that, that, that are offered aren't new. Um, putting it in, you know, a grip isn't new. Uh, and, you know, playing with something like this. You know, like a, a, a pro controller kind of thing. That's not new. Uh, and playing, you know, with the twin sticks on the sides. That's not really new either. Uh, Nintendo isn't really innovating right now anyways in how we control a video game. But they are innovating in how we experience video games. From being able to... Uh, and, and, and I say innovating, this isn't to say that this is Nintendo's original idea to have something that docks on your TV and, and comes with you. But to popularize that idea is a type of innovation. It's a type of technology to come at the right time, uh, it, which matters almost more than being the first to do it. Because Nintendo is not the first to try this. Many of our smartphones can actually do the same thing. But Nintendo was the one to popularize it with gaming specifically. And I think the way Nintendo did it has been mostly brilliant, despite some design flaw flaws and stuff like that, and, so and some hiccups along the way, you know, Joy-Con drift. So when you, when you see Furukawa talk about the most important thing when a new technology appears is how the quality of users' gaming experience changes, uh, that, that could be anything, because right now Nintendo's not really on the kick of we want to offer new innovative control methods. Uh, back when they did the Wii, you know, they, they talked about how controllers got too complicated, so we need to do that. Well, controllers since then haven't gotten really more complicated. They've kind of standardized, and people have gotten used to being to those standardized controls. So now that Nintendo isn't so afraid of those standardized controls, and now it comes down to... Uh, innovating in other ways and right now uh, for the switch pro and stuff like that we got to be talking about uh, new technology uh, new ways to make it better whether it's screen technology uh, whether it's just processing and, and, and CPU technology because he talks about how it's important for the game themselves to be interesting new and be able to give surprises regardless of what the technological environment is those that develop games first create content they think consumers want to obtain and play you know, when they look at what's being super successful on Switch, you're seeing games like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, which is a Wii U port. You're seeing games, you know, like uh, Breath of the Wild, as an example, which is, again, another Wii U port, technically. Uh, super Mario Odyssey. You're seeing games that are more in the traditional base, but find a way to appeal to gamers by broadening the type of games and the type of experience Nintendo offers that isn't necessarily controller-dependent. 
And that is something we haven't seen Nintendo do in quite some time. Everything they've been making has been very um, dependent upon the control mechanisms. You know, even like Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, you know, they were forcing you to use the touchscreen and the stylus and, and stuff like that. And that's changing now. Now it's like, look, instead of us focusing on these, these sort of gimmicky kind of things, because that's what they really are. You haven't seen, you know, motion controls in a Zelda game, you know, kind of go from Waggle and Twilight Princess to full motion in Skyward Sword, and then it stopped. They didn't do it anymore. Uh, you saw touchscreen, you know, Phantom Hourglass and spirit tracks and then it just kind of stopped um you see that that's the those little gimmicks don't have the staying power but what does have the staying power is creating innovative game experiences within the games themselves that people want to keep playing and want to experience and that's made breath of the wild probably one of the most replayed zelda games of all time um probably up there with ocarina of time with how many people like to replay that as well and uh, when we talk about these new technologies, you know, you have to think back to that Digitimes report. Remember, Digitimes came out and talked about, you know, magnesium alloy, mass production, new CPU, and the sources for their information kind of come from a little bit of the product production line. Uh, and it's easy to, to see why they would know that there's a new CPU while not having a lot of details about the CPU because if they have access to the production lines, that means they probably have seen the boards that are going in here, and the boards probably have smaller chipsets on them. You don't have to see the chip to see a smaller chipset. And, and, and like the Tegra X1 Nintendo uses is a 20 nanometer chip, which is just ancient technology by today's standards. You have you know AMD and others going straight to 7 nanometer. Uh, Intel's doing 10 nanometer. 14 nanometer was actually standard at the time that, you know, this, this, this 20 nanometer chip was even created back in 2015. 14 nanometer was actually uh, popular. And, and those are all... Um, shrinking of the die because when you shrink the die it becomes more power efficient um, and you can put different resistors and, and more power into it and faster speeds so it's kind of weird you know we're making something smaller actually makes it better and faster uh, whereas you would think well can't you make everything smaller but keep the chip the same size and fit more on it no, you just make a 7 nanometer chip and you just expand the node. That's what Ryzen does anyways. AMD is just like, hey, we're going to make these 7 nanometer chips and then we can just make multiple of them and then just have it go crazy on ham. I don't know that they're going to do something crazy like that for Switch. But um, new technology is not something that's often talked about by Nintendo, at least from my recollection. If I'm wrong on this, feel free to link me to the interviews and the, and the videos uh, that show this because I went back and looked at, gosh, I think it was over four dozen different interviews and statements by Owada and Kimishima. Uh, I didn't go go uh, much further back than Owada because at that point you're getting to the really, really old days. And, yet, you know, I don't know how much of that really applies to today. Uh, and I don't recall them talking about new technology in this way and talking about, you know, trying to create games that, that consumers want to obtain and play first rather than talking about changing the way we play. Uh, it's a very different stance of changing the way we play to making games that people actually want. Um, and uh, I, I think this is very interesting and very telling that Nintendo is more focused now on a direction with, uh, w w with things like the Switch and the Switch Pro um, that we haven't seen them focused on before. And that direction basically being uh, one where they are starting to care a little bit about new technology and how games perform and how they look, which is something that we haven't seen Nintendo care about in a long time. Uh, maybe not since the GameCube days. And um, this isn't me saying Switch Pro, the next Switch, are going to be looking at trying to you know match the Xbox Series X with 12 teraflops of GPU performance. Like, obviously, Nintendo's not looking at you know going head to head, but they do think they realize uh, the importance of um, being at the forefront of the technological expansion and taking advantage of that with their games and convincing third parties to come to their system as well. You know, we're not just getting games like The Witcher 3 and Mortal Kombat 11, uh, Doom Eternal and The Outer Worlds and stuff. We're not getting these big AAA-esque games coming to Switch. Heck, rumored now Red Dead Redemption 2. We're not getting these games coming to Switch uh, because, you know, the companies just feel like tossing it there. Nintendo's been talking to these companies. Nintendo knows what third-party companies value. And while Nintendo is not going to be able to directly compete with like these next-gen platforms or even like the Xbox One X or the PlayStation 4 Pro, they don't have to. For what Nintendo is doing, they just have to give third parties what they need to make a portable, you know, dockable version possible. And they did that with this Switch. And now they're worried about the future. And I believe they're going to be doing that with the Switch Pro. 
I don't know how much better it's going to be, how much better the performance is, but just shrinking the die alone is going to open up so many more avenues for better GPU, better um, you know CPU performance. So basically, better APU performance on the whole. You can maybe put more RAM on the thing. Uh, there's a lot of directions they could go with this that are going to appease these third-party developers and going to also appease Nintendo. Because remember, Nintendo's still making games and they very much care about it. And you know, something like Breath of the Wild 2 could very well be like a 60 FPS game on a Switch Pro, but 30 FPS on the original, taking advantage of those new technologies and caring about the user experience and making us want to obtain something specifically because of those experiences. So I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm way off base on this and reading too much into it. Uh, that's what we tend to do uh, as analysts and as, uh, as as just video game fans on the whole. We tend to overread into to comments made uh, by, by you know corporate entities and stuff, but... Um, I don't know, you guys let me know what you think about this. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about Switch Pro, I feel, a ton this year, along with the Xbox Series X and Series S, which I think is what they're going to call the low-end system, uh, and the PlayStation 5. Yes, the PlayStation 5 logo was unveiled, unveiled at CES. Didn't think it was really newsworthy, to be completely honest. Um, but, uh, hey, it's the same font as it's always been. Congrats. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you guys let me know what you think about this down in the comments below. I am Nate Jansen. I want to thank you for tuning into this video. And you know what? I'm going to catch you in the next one. Oh, hey, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff that us YouTubers are supposed to say to get more subscribers. <laughs> catch you later.